Good morning, my name is Cédric Chavez. I'm the coordinator of uh, this drug consumption room, one of the three drug consumption rooms of the Regenbog Group. Um, I am also working for Correlation Network as field officer. I am promoting the establishment of drug consumption room in Europe and worldwide. Uh, I personally think that the drug consumption room are uh, extremely efficient uh, ways to tackle many problems and I will repeat now what are the goals of a drug consumption room worldwide and this one included. Uh, there are three main goals. One is to reduce the public nuisance associated to drug use. One of the other goal is to limit the drug overdose death and uh, the last one officially is to reduce the possibility of contamination HIV hepatitis C. Regarding the public nuisance, since the opening of the very first drug consumption room in the Netherlands, the associated drug public nuisance have almost disappeared. I don't know if you've been walking in the street of Amsterdam, but there is very few visible signs of homelessness and drug use. So that means that the job has been done. If you imagine that in the late 80s there were 30,000 drug users in the street of Amsterdam in an what we call open scene. Regarding of the hepatitis H and HIV, uh, uh, specifically on HIV, the drug consumption room have proven their impact on the general HIV uh, uh, situation. Before the establishment of drug consumption room, the HIV ratio within injectors in the Netherlands was between 12 and 18 percent. Right away after the opening of the drug consumption room, we dropped under 4 percent, which is the general uh, public average contamination. In the last 10 years, uh, there is only one case reported among registered injectors in the Health Authority of Amsterdam, which means we almost eradicated HIV with all the measures in place, including drug consumption room. The drug consumption room is not the answer to the problem, but it's one of the piece of the puzzle. The other one being access to needle exchange, possibility to be tested, access to PrEP, etc., etc. Uh, we have, as you can see, a room with smokers and injectors. On the table with containers, it's purely for injection. On the tables without container, people can smoke. Uh, whatever drugs people like, we don't discriminate. All drugs are allowed in this room, but no alcohol. That's the only drug that we do not tolerate in the room because we know that in combination with a lot of downers, it leads to much more incident and to much more stressful behavior that we cannot monitor when people are too much under influence of alcohol inside the drug consumption room. Our target group is using in priority heroin cocaine, a little bit of amphetamine, benzodiazepine and cannabis. For the rest, I've seen every single drug coming in this drug consumption room from crystal meth to uh, I don't know, even uh, Viagra. Not that you get high from it, but people probably trade Viagra for amphetamine or whatever it is. But really what I can say is the clients are really conservative. They started in their country of origin with heroin. They bring their addiction here and they stick on heroin. Same with cocaine. And we've seen people who have been trying to switch from cocaine to amphetamine. They constantly come back to cocaine because it's absolutely not the same high and people are always in search of the original high. So the mellow high of cocaine cannot be replaced by any other upper. So what we see is that really people stick to heroin cocaine and the rest is what we call parallel use. As you can see in this drug consumption room, we have been focusing on the social aspect. It's one of the few or if maybe not the last drug consumption room with a sofa, very colorful chair, colorful furniture, a lot of art on the wall. This is a choice for us. Uh, a lot of our practice is based on the theory of the rat park from Bruce K. Alexander, who explained very clearly within his research that uh, socialization and uh, human interaction is extremely important for us as human. And uh, we try to recreate what he called the rat park. Instead of being a rat alone in a cage who is experience, experiencing the most stress, uh, rat in cages 
who live in their families experience less stress and we try to reproduce this at the human level. So that's why people are facing each other when they are using. Um, <coughs> They can come here, they can listen to their radio, they can read the newspaper. We really promote the social interaction uh, more than being only focused on the drug use. We are not really focused on the drug itself, the drug use a bit to monitor that the, the way of using is correctly done, but we are very uh, busy uh, man managing or let's say monitoring the behaviors here. The most uh, problem that we encounter in a drug consumption room in such a small space with a lot of drug users is tension due to a lot of people in one room under influence. But the drug itself is not a, a major concern since we have a very, very low amount of uh, overdose per year. On a, on a significant year, we call the ambulance three to six times, which is very few if we compare to other uh, local realities like in France, in Canada, or else. This comes from different factors. Our clients are, how can I say it, conservative. They stick to heroin cocaine. We see very few new drugs. There is no NPS, there is no fentanyl yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, uh, we are uh, very aware of the risk of taking drugs, heroin, cocaine, the client also, and they make sure they don't come into the overdose situation. The overdose that we encounter are mostly related to a high consumption of alcohol during the night and benzodiazepine in combination with other drug use during the day here. And an addition of all those products with tiredness uh, make that overdose may occur. When I say we call the ambulance, it's for backup, we have never had a lethal overdose in any of the drug consumption room worldwide. So that is something very important to remember. I would like to just say a couple of words about the room itself. Uh, we have been focusing on the stress by copying the Rat Park experiment here, but we are uh, very focused on two other aspects, and I will repeat a lot of times the same words, that is safety, hygiene, stress-free. Everything in this room is based on this. So the safety, just basic features. We have no tables with corners. If somebody is falling, at least he's not going to break his skull. We have uh, metal plates, so at least it's no glass. Nothing is breakable. This is not a mirror. This is aluminum plates. And all the windows, they have a security on it. Uh, it's like a windshield of a car. If somebody will throw something at the window, it will not break. It will just make a big spider web. So there is a lot of safety features, I'm not going into more detail, but safety is important. But before we talk about the features itself, what is important is the feeling of safety. For sure you are safe because it cannot break, you will not break your skull on the table, but the idea of feeling safe is very important. And how do you feel safe? In a drug consumption room in the Netherlands, it is legal to use drugs. So first, the police will not come here to arrest you because you are a drug user, so you can feel more comfortable to use your own drug. Uh, the dealers are not allowed to come here to ask you for the debt you owe them. Uh, your friends, your family is not supposed to know you are here. It's an individual contract where we respect the privacy of the client, so you are comfortable, safe, and uh, with not a high level of stress when you are using drugs. So you feel safe and you are safe. Being safe is also having access to hygiene. The hygiene is very important. So, feature again, hygienic material always in display. People can access as much as material as they want. We have no limit of material that people can use. The material is offered for free from the health authority. Since the creation of the drug consumption room, the health authority give us as much material as we need because the health authority decided that the drug consumption room are part of a global plan to eradicate HIV hepatitis C and therefore they don't see why they should limit the amount of material because every needle coming out of a health authority or out of a drug consumption room is an act of prevention. Every contamination today of HIV will cost the, the taxpayer a million euros. So let's give free needles.
In terms of hygiene, as you understand, we make sure that everybody uses on a clean plate and everything in this room can be cleaned with heavy duty cleaning material. The wall can be clean, the floor is a particular floor, I will say something in a second about it. Uh, we limit the human contact, that means everything is pretty much simple, that you don't have too much human contact because what are the enemies of the drug users? That's bacteria and dirt. So we have to clean this room very well at the end of the day and limit human contact. What you will see in this building, there is no interrupters for the light in the toilet. The light comes by itself. The same, there is no more uh, tissues for the toilet to dry your hands. Only in the drug consumption room, the rest of the building is blowers. This is all to limit human contact, to limit bacteria and dirt. You can have access to an hygienic environment to use, but it's not enough. We consider the hygiene as a packet and therefore we want that the clients access not only an hygienic place to use under supervision, but also a place where they can have a shower, change their clothes, uh, rest, sleep, drink water and eat food. Because this is part of a whole hygienic packet who makes the engine running. When you take drugs, it takes a lot of energy from you, so you have to refill the engine. And we have seen a lot of our users through the years who have more impact of bad hygiene than using drugs. And I give you an example. In the summer, a lot of our homeless population is walking the street of Amsterdam with a very heavy backpack. And when they walk with the sweat, the backpacks start to scratch the shoulders. Then it gets an infected wounds. And we have people with major size abscess on the shoulder, like the size of a fist. This is extremely painful, it can bring to a lot of bacterial infection, septicemia, whatever it can lead to. And therefore, we want not only that people use in a hygienic environment, but we also promote that they take regularly shower, change their clothes, take very good care of their foot, or feet, sorry. Um, a homeless with, with, with dead feet is not able to survive the street. So we really promote that the people wash their feet regularly, they dry it very well, and we promote that they wear new socks, clean socks, dry socks. We live in the Netherlands, it's a very humid country, and humidity can lead to a lot of uh, skin rash, uh, bacterial infection on the foot. We have an extremely strong ventilation for the room itself. We have a lot of people here who are injecting and smoking drugs, mostly heroin, cocaine. The heroin, and especially the cocaine smoke is a very fat smoke. It will obstruct all the filters of a normal ventilation. So when we created this room, we had to ask for a specialized company to come to measure the cubic meter of this room and the, the sort of the type of smoke which is smoked in there. And they realized that a normal ventilation will not do. So for a room like this one, which is eight by eight, it's pretty much the size of a ventilation for a nightclub with filters who are in a room downstairs which are pretty much the size of this green cabinet and the filters are changed every three months. In this room, everything is considered as contaminated. We have no normal trash. We have only biohazard container, as you can see, the biohazard sign, and the needle container have a safety door. So if it falls, the needle don't fall out of it. Once they are full, whatever is the container or the needle container, we close it. I seal it, nobody can open it, and a company comes once a week, they recycle it and they bring us new containers. We have an average of 18 clients a day. We, 18, one eight. We can have up to 36 clients under the supervision of two staff members. And if we will have more requests of clients, which mean more than 36 per day, I will have to ask another budget. And actually, it's very simple. The re regulation is one worker, 18 clients, two, 36, three, 54, and so on. Mm -hmm. It has been decided in uh, collaboration with the fire brigade, the police, and the organization. We created the whole concept around the stress because we realized that we work with a group of long-term hard drug users. And the long-term hard drug users feel very lonely outside in the street. And the fact 
that we are working around the socialization is also to tackle loneliness of hard drug users. Loneliness makes the human very stressful. And as a user, how do you respond to stress? By using more drugs. But using more drugs isolates you from more, from your peer, from your family. So you get even more lonely. So it's a non-stop triangle that is really hard to stop. And to break this cycle, we try to work ourselves on tackling the loneliness. People talk to each other. And another thing to, to go even further in the concept of tackling loneliness, a drug consumption room is theoretically designed for homeless population. But we know that we have some of our clients who did and do have a house now. They have housing first, or they manage to have an address to stay, permanent and quite stable. But they still request to come to the drug consumption room. And for us it's fine, because we know too well that they will be so lonely in their house alone, the TV is never going to ask them how they are doing today. So we allow people who are in transition for at least two years after they acquire a house or a housing to come here for the socialization aspect. It's very hard for a person who has been 25 years in the street using heroin and cocaine to join the salsa club of the neighborhood or the bridge club. So this is their peer, this is the place they feel better, and there is somebody who is asking them, how are you doing today? Did you go to see your doctor? Did you call your mother? Whatever it has to be. But there is a bit of uh, empathy and attention given to a group that people otherwise would ignore. The company itself, the Regenboog Group, there is 250 paid employees and 1,000 volunteers. That gives you a bit an idea of the size of it. We are one of the three biggest ones in terms of homelessness, addiction, and psychiatry. But we do service in drop-in center, drug consumption room, but we do a lot of ambulant care. That means one-to-one -one meeting outside of the usual drop-ins. And many other organiz uh, many other uh, project, for example, social firm. We have some companies who produce things to be sold in the private sector, but who are still helped by the Regenbogh Group. For example, there is a neighborhood farm, which is a cafe, restaurant, which is open for public, anybody. Uh, there is another company who is uh, making beer, and this is part of a uh, reintegration program for people who used to be in the street and who are now working to make beers and sell the beer in different cafes, restaurants. Uh, there is a company who is printing books, uh, report, flyers, t-shirts, anything like that. This is also what we call a social company. So if you take a moment on the website, you will be lost through the thousands, through the hundreds of projects, all of them in the interest of the homeless population of Amsterdam.